Happy Mother's Day on this Sunday, May 10th. And I hope everyone has a blessed day today. We're going to continue our format on Sundays of a first reading, a psalm reading, and a second lesson reading. We'll go into a gospel reading and then go into the message. So we'll start off with our first lesson reading, which will be from Acts chapter 6. We'll be reading verses 1 through 7. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve called a meeting of all the believers. They said, We apostles should spend our time teaching the Word of God, not running a food program. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the Word. Everyone liked this idea, and they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenos, and Nicholas of Antioch an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them and laid their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem and many of the Jewish priests were converted as well. Our psalm reading is going to be from Psalm 146, all the verses 1 through 9. Hallelujah! Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in rulers nor in any child of earth, for there is no help in them. When they breathe their last, they return to earth, and in that day their thoughts perish. Happy are they who have the God of Jacob for their help whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the seas and all that is in them, who keeps his promise forever, who gives justice to those who are oppressed and food to those who hunger. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord cares for the stranger. He sustains the orphan and widow, but frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever, your God, O Zion, throughout all generations. Hallelujah! Our second lesson reading is going to be from the first book of Peter, chapter 2, verses 2 through 10. Like newborn babies, you must crave spirit, pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment, now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As the scriptures say, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Yes, you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him. But for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And he is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they do not obey God's word, and so they meet the fate that was planned for them. But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, 
Now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Our Gospel reading for today, which is also going to be the text we use for our message, uh, is going to be from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. Jesus says this, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you, so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I am going. No, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said this, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, and even greater works, because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it, so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Our message today is going to be about Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. Now some of you in your school time have, remember a poem that was written back in the mid-19th century by the American poet God, John Godfrey Sachs. And he wrote a poem titled, The Blind Man and the Elephant. In the poem, Six blind men go observe an elephant to understand what one really is. One blindly walks into the elephant's side and proclaims that the elephant is like a wall. The second felt his tusk and confidently said the elephant was like a spear. The third grabbed its trunk and said, oh, why of course, the elephant is like a snake. The fourth Feeling the elephant's leg said that it was obvious to any thinking person that the elephant was like a tree. The fifth blind man ran his hand across the elephant's ear and was sure that the elephant was like a fan. Finally, the sixth man took hold of the tail and announced the elephant was like a rope. So the poet Sachs sums up the poem by saying this, and so these men of Indistan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion exceedingly stiff and strong. Though each was partly in the right, all were in the wrong. We laugh at this poem, and yet how much different are the six blind men touching different parts of the elephant, just like people touching different parts of Christianity today, and proclaiming that what they think is the truth. Like the blind men, there are people who think they know what God is like, even though some may only have it partly right, they are still also wrong. They are like blind people groping about, 
One sees this part of God, another sees something different. And each of their experiences are legitimate. However, they all fail to get at the reality of what God is like and who he really is. In the Christian faith, we do not rely on individual experience, although those experiences can be genuine and real. Instead, believers rely on what the Bible calls revelation. If we take a look at the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 through 17, Jesus asked the disciples who people were saying he was. The disciples said that some were saying that he was Elijah, and some said John the Baptist, and some that he was one of the Old Testament prophets who had come back to life. This is just like the blind men in the poem who were saying, He is a wall. No, a snake. No, a tree. However, Jesus then asked the disciples who they said he was. And Peter gives this amazing reply. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. However, also very important to this statement in the last part of 17, Jesus says this, You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. This proclamation of truth was not something Peter could have figured out on his own. It was something that had to be revealed to him by God. Peter, mis Peter understood who Jesus was only because God had revealed that truth to him. And the same is true for each of us. Without God's revelation, we would each have a piece of the truth without knowing how it relates to the whole. Just like those blind men and the elephant. So this morning, this morning, we're not relying on a variety of opinions from blind investigators. Instead, we're going to take a look at some specific revelations that God has revealed about himself through his son, Jesus. Jesus proclaims this in verse 6 from our gospel text for today. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus proclaims, I am the way. Well, the first thing we need to understand is that you and I are definitely not the way. And there are two errors present today which cause people to believe in their thinking that they are the way. The first error, error is a New Age philosophy. Now, the New Age religion convinces some people that since they are spiritual beings, they are in effect a, a god. This is a very appealing thing to people because it means that if they are their own god, then they get to make all their own rules. And because they would submit only to their own will and desires, then they do not have to submit to the rule of any other God. So what we have today are people who are trying to be spiritual without having any experience or relationship with any God other than themselves. They are attracted to all kinds of spiritual issues and make no differentiation between religions or gods, good or evil, conflicting ideologies, or moral distinctions. As long as it is some kind of spiritual, it's all good. People may be into Eastern mysticism, astrology, crystals, or even astral projection to feel in tune with their spiritual realm. What's interesting, though, is that most of these smorgasbord spiritual people do not even ever consider Jesus 
as an option. This is because Jesus calls all of his followers to die to themselves. And any time the truth involves a total commitment in which you bring yourself to complete humility and the surrender of the will, you will always have resistance. Because at the heart of the rejection of Jesus as the Christ is a resistance to the claim of who he really is. And that's the ultimate truth of it all. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You and I can never be the way. Jesus is the only way we can come to God. We are not God, and we cannot become our God. Neither can we be our own Savior. Because if we would be good enough to save ourselves from our sins and get to heaven on our own, Jesus died on the cross for nothing. So it really comes down to this, folks. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. That means we either believe Jesus truly is the way, or we are. There can be no sitting on the fence for that one. So this brings us to the second error of people, is that other religions can also be a way to the truth of life. Now, this is one of the major objections people have about the Christian faith. They believe that, some of them believe that Christianity is just one of many ways to get to heaven. What this thinking does, though, is put all the religions in a gigantic spiritual smorgasbord and just invites people to come and take a little of this and a little of that. And they take whatever philosophical and theological parts that they like and they call it good. However, what if the reality is that only one of those things on the smorgasbord is actually food and the rest has no nutritional value? Think of it this way. Imagine that through a cancer research program, there's a sudden breakthrough in the cure for cancer. A completely non-invasive, painless, one-time treatment that would reverse the spread and completely cure the cancer. Now let's stretch this concept even further. Imagine that this is not just a partial cure for some people but that it works every time for everyone. Now let's imagine that everyone on the planet has cancer and is in need of a cure. Would it be closed-minded, narrow, or arrogant for these cancer research scientists who developed this cure to say, this is the only cure for cancer? Of course, others would still be free to try other forms to cure their cancer. Radiation treatments or herbs, acupuncture, and many other options. However, would it be wrong to try and convince these people that there really was only one way? And would it be wrong to believe in that only one true cure? Now, this is not to say that other religions of the world do not, don't have some truth in their teachings. And it's also not to say that the other religions do not have some core values and that they do not promote a moral code. That's not what we're saying here. The ultimate question of truth, though, is this. Are these other religions a way to God? Are they the true cure for our sin and separation from God. The reality is that just having some truth about God 
is like holding the tail of an elephant and believing you know all about it. So when humans rely upon themselves to try and figure out God, it's like the blind, blind man reaching out for a part of the elephant. And that's what separates the Christian faith from all other religions. Christianity is not about people reaching for God. It's about God reaching for us. It's about God revealing himself to us, giving us the scriptures, coming to us, and then giving himself for us. So let's, let's put all of this together. Jesus proclaimed, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Plain and simply, this means Jesus is the only way to God. And because of this truth, we are then faced with the following conclusion. Either Jesus is who he said he was, or he is a liar and a fraud. There is no in-between here. The Bible clearly states that Jesus is the Savior from sin and the only way to get to heaven. And so if we reject that Jesus Christ is the only way to God, we are not only rejecting the words of Jesus himself, but we are also rejecting the witness of Scripture, the proclamation of the historic church, and the testimony of all those who have experienced this reality in their lives throughout the ages. Another interesting thing about other religions is that none of their leaders claim to be God. Certainly, none of them have a God who comes to earth in human form in order to die for them a redemptive death and then rise from the dead. And yet, these are the claims of Jesus and his followers. The Bible summarizes and proclaims this truth in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. So each of us needs to ask ourselves this. When we seek for the way and the truth in our lives, will we seek for this truth within the politically correct doctrines of our day? Or will we believe the words of Scripture that the way and the truth for eternal life is only through Jesus. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you that, we have, that you have given us your holy word to proclaim the truths about who you are and how we can be with you. Lord, we also thank you that the only way to be with you is through your son Jesus. Help us, Lord to proclaim that it is only through your Son, Jesus, that we can find the way, the truth, and the life of being with you. And it is through the holy name of your Son, Jesus, that we pray.
may the Lord bless you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord shine His face upon you and give you His everlasting strength and peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord.